Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan and I'm the Policy and Programs Manager at Musculoskeletal Australia and I'd like to warmly welcome you to our webinar on the topic of scleroderma and Raynaud's phenomenon this evening. I'm with Musculoskeletal Australia's focus on empowering consumers through, through education and support services. We have been offering a series of webinars for a consumer audience during 2020. We are also currently in the process of planning our series for next year as well. If you wish to register for our other webinars in the series or haven't already done so, or you want to view recordings of our previous webinars, please go to our website. When you visit our website, I hope you take approximately 15 minutes to respond to our national consumer survey, which officially commenced recently. This is the first national consumer driven survey for people with musculoskeletal conditions and we are hoping that many people around Australia will let their voices be heard by completing the survey. Please tell your family, friends, colleagues and networks about this very important survey. So you'll find our national consumer survey and our other information resources on our website www.msk.org.au. Also, don't forget our national um, national helpline, which can be reached on 1800 263 265. Further details are available on our website. Now, we've just been informed by our web our provider that they are experiencing experiencing some difficulties with their system this evening, so we may experience some slowness in the vision and movement of the slides. So bear with us and be patient, as this is something that is beyond our control. Our presenter for this evening is Dr. Nava Fadasi. It was after completing her rheumatology training at St. Vincent's Hospital that, in Melbourne that Nava's interest in looking after patients with scleroderma was sparked. She went on to complete a postgraduate master's degree researching scleroderma patients under the supervision of Associate Professor Mandana Nikor and Dr Wendy Stevens, and has since remained involved with research and patient care. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Nava. Thanks very much, Nava. Thank you, Jen, uh, and thank you to um, MSK Australia for the invitation to uh, speak to you all tonight. Um, I, uh, um, as Jen already uh, mentioned, I uh, completed my training at St Vincent's Hospital uh, where we look after a very large cohort of patients with scleroderma um, as we are one of the main centres and the largest centre in Australia um, that uh, uh, performs a cardiopulmonary screening program uh, for patients with scleroderma together with Monash Hospital in uh, Victoria and also uh, multiple other centres across Australia. Um, so, uh, the first off, I thought I might uh, talk to you about scleroderma and really who gets it. As with many other autoimmune conditions, um, it seems to be a predominant condition in women. So, it's five times more common in women compared to men. Um, and the peak age of onset is um, in the younger years, probably between the ages of 30 to 50 is the most common um, uh, age to uh, first present with the diagnosis of scleroderma. And overall, it is a very rare autoimmune condition and probably one of the rarer ones in all the connective tissue diseases um, with about a one in 10,000 prevalence um, across the world. And, and these figures are quite variable depending on which country does its incidence and prevalence data. Um, it's also very rare to see multiple members of the same families affected with this, which is one of the questions we do tend to get as clinicians, um, is whether or not this is something that will be passed on in the generations. And this is very, very rare to see. Um, scleroderma itself is labelled as a connective tissue disease. And I guess um, connective tissue disease is a very broad term. Um, and the connective tissues are really any of the tissues that are supporting structures of our organs in our body. Um, and that includes um, anything around nerves, muscles, and any of the internal organs. Um, blood, blood vessels, cartilage, bone are all considered uh, connective tissue diseases. Um, and scleroderma is considered as an autoimmune disease, which means that your immune system has been abnormally triggered and begins to attack or damage your connective tissue diseases. So, sorry, your connective tissues. Um, and that's 
through two main processes. One is through damage of blood vessels and ultimately that damage leading to narrowing of blood vessels and also the increased production of collagen. Um, so you can see here that there's really three main processes going on. That immune dysfunction, so that autoimmune component leading to both fibrosis, which means hardening or scarring through that increased collagen production, and also vasculopathy, which is another word for vessels that become damaged and narrow. What I wanted to talk about next was what happens when we have too much collagen, uh, which is really um, the thing that leads to um, the most predominant symptom, which is skin changes and Raynaud's phenomenon, which is what I'll focus on in our um, in our in my presentation tonight. So really, when there's too much collagen production, we see that skin gets tighter and thicker. Um, and it's usually first noticeable in the fingers and the hands. Um, and when this occurs, it can be very hard for the joints to move. And sometimes it makes your, it very difficult for your hands to straighten in a relaxed position, which then leads to contractures, which is another uh, very common presentation of scleroderma. Um, unfortunately, this increased collagen production can occur in any part of the body um, and the internal organs um, can also be affected um, and in particular the lungs, the heart and all parts of the gastrointestinal tract can be affected with this increased collagen production leading to either vessel damage or inability for the surrounding musculature to work. When organs become stiff, they don't function properly. And this is something that we become very um, worried and we monitor very closely in patients with scleroderma because obviously when internal, organ, um, uh, 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 internal organs are affected, this is when we um, want to obviously monitor things very closely. Um, and ultimately this um, can affect life expectancy when um, these things do occur. As part of that increased collagen uh, production, I've mentioned how that can also affect the blood vessels. And when the blood vessels narrow, um, this is when Raynaud's phenomenon can occur, which is really what we're going to be focusing on in the presentation tonight. Um, when the blood vessels narrow, obviously nutrients and uh, are very uh, are carried in the blood and when they don't get to the organs then organ damage can occur and in particular when this happens in the kidneys this can lead to high blood pressure and kidney failure. And given that we've been, we're going to be talking about um, Raynaud's phenomenon in, um, in particular I thought I'd focus mostly on the skin and uh, joint involvement in scleroderma and touch briefly on the internal organs um, but with the skin the first symptoms that may be noticeable, noticeable are thickening of the skin and um, quite a lot of itchiness can occur in those beginning phases, puffiness of the fingers and tightness or inability to clench or make a fist. Um, the skin colour can also change uh, with either hyperpigmentation or hypopigmentation or darker or lighter spots of the skin. And sometimes this can also lead to a bit of hair loss or hair thinning, whether it be on the arms, legs, or even on the scalp. Um, if Raynaud's phenomenon and lots of skin tightness can occur, then ulcerations can also occur on, on the fingertips and also the toes. And some typical features um, of scleroderma are two things, uh, calcinosis and telangiectasias. Calcinosis is essentially really hard white um, calcium deposits that can come in through the skin, um, particularly on the fingers, sometimes over the elbows and knees as well. And telangiectasias are really a kind of another word for spider veins that are um, quite common in uh, particularly the limited form of scleroderma, which I'll um, talk to further. I've got some pictures that will be popping up now about some typical presentations. And here we can see um, a hand of a patient with scleroderma. And, I guess the first thing to notice that it does seem quite shiny and almost concrete looking. We can also see that this patient um, has some contractures of the fingers or the inability to um, straighten the fingers completely um, and that the skin does look hard and thickened. The next photo is um, kind of a more of a close-up photo of a patient's, the pulps of the patient's fingers um, and here we can see what we call some digital pitting or some dry ulcerations here and here are these white lumps 
um, that you may notice that some are poking through just through the skin. Um, these are the deposits of calcinosis, which I um, talked to in the previous slide. Um, and the next slide is really showing that classical Raynaud's phenomenon, which is actually a very um, common phenomena to occur even without an underlying autoimmune disease. And so here is the um, photo of a quite classical presentation of Raynaud's phenomenon. And as I mentioned, um, having Raynaud's phenomenon is actually very common, particularly in young women. I myself also get Raynaud's phenomenon, particularly in, in the cold winter mornings in Melbourne. Um, and really it's that classical triphasic colour changes of the fingers. So initially the fingers um, turn white and, and it tends to predominate in certain fingers in each individual. Um, and here you can see it's kind of the, the fourth and fifth digits in this patient. Um, and that, that those colour changes then turn to blue and then quite a deep red um, when, um, when the blood flow then returns to the finger. In this photo that will pop up, um, you can see both the hand changes that have some scleroderma um, and contractures and actually some Raynaud's phenomenon probably going on in this photo as well, um, where the fingers are, are unable to be straightened. Um, and then we can also see the typical kind of facial changes again with that shiny texture that looks thickened over um, the face. You can see some pursing of the lips, which um, again is really because that skin has become tight and tighter, so mouth opening can become affected. And you can also see um, if the photo allows some telangiectasias on the face. So some of those red kind of spider veins, but just under the nose, you can see one in this patient. The next slide I'll really be um, speaking to you about some other common presentations. So obviously the skin is a com is the predominant presentation in patients with scleroderma. And um, actually it comes from the Greek word sclerosis, which means hardening and derma meaning skin. So um, the disease itself was predominantly um, one of the skin, well, initially thought to be one of the skin, but really, as I've already mentioned, um, most other organs can become affected. Um, some of the other uh, issues that patients will talk about quite a lot is dry eyes and dry mouth, which is really um, quite a distressing feature because it affects your day to day so, so commonly. Um, vaginal dryness can also occur, um, joint pain and joint swelling and an inflammatory arthritis and inflammatory tendonitis can occur. So both tendons and joints can become inflamed requiring treatment. And um, again, tiredness and fatigue is very, very common symptom, particularly in the early phases. I also wanted to speak to the different subtypes of scleroderma. So you may uh, find clinicians um, place uh, a diagnosis in either a limited um, scleroderma or diffuse scleroderma. Um, and also I'll speak briefly about a more lo localised form of scleroderma called morphia, which is actually not scleroderma. It's a condition on its own, um, but can cause some skin hardening. Limited scleroderma, um, really these are kind of uh, cutoff points that have been determined um, by the initial investigators of scleroderma looking at the extent of skin hardening or that the, the skin thickening that can occur. And in limited scleroderma, the skin thickening and hardening is limited to below the elbow and below the knee. Um, it can affect the face and across the chest also. So limited means limited to below the elbow, below the knee and including the face. Whereas diffuse disease, you can see on the diagram on the right, um, is really skin hardening that can affect anywhere in the body. So from the fingers all the way up the arm, um, affecting the chest and the trunk as well as the abdomen and all throughout the legs and the face also. So the two subtypes are really just determined by the extent of the skin disease. As I already mentioned, morphia is actually not scleroderma, but um, has traditionally been called localised scleroderma. And it's the condition where there is only skin involvement. It never involves the internal organs. It does not cause Raynaud's phenomenon um, and really just can um, be skin hardening that is localised in any part of the body and doesn't typically um, always affect the hands or the feet, can also skip the hands and feet and, and affect other limb, other parts of the limbs. Um, as already mentioned, it doesn't progress to systemic involvement, so any internal organs, and is always ANA negative. And I'll, and I'll come to some of the blood tests that are important in the diagnosis of scleroderma um, and ANA being one of them. In morphia, um, we, we 
we see that it, you, you, there is no ANA on, detectable on the patient's blood. I thought I might also touch on the differences um, in the disease onset in limited and diffuse scleroderma because it helps us with the diagnosis. Limited scleroderma does tend to be more of a slow onset of symptoms. So the symptoms may be grumbling along for some years and sometimes not even really bothering the patient too much to even require a presentation to a doctor. Um, a lot of times patients will say I've, that they've had Raynaud's phenomenon for many years and again, not something that's necessarily bothered them enough to even present to a doctor. And that skin progression does tend to be quite slow and doesn't go above the elbow, as already mentioned. Um, the face and the neck can become affected um, and again, doesn't extend up the thigh, so just from the knee below. Um, in diffuse scleroderma, however, it does tend to be more of a sudden onset of presentation. So a patient will tend to say that they um, had normal looking skin and then all of a sudden they noticed hardening, a new onset of Raynaud's phenomenon which they'd never had before. Um, and that those skin changes kind of rapidly progressing up the limb, um, whether it be from the hands or the feet up. Um, and uh, the, the patients will tend to notice that the abdomen is involved quite early in their presentation as well. Next slide is really kind of a visual presentation of this where you can see that um, in the first um, couple of years of someone presenting with limited disease, there's a very small spike upwards of the symptoms um, and in particular skin thickness. And then that tends to level off and doesn't seem to progress um, significantly over the next decade. Whereas with diffuse disease, you tend to see that skin thickness very quickly within the first 12 months affect various parts of the body. And then it actually can soften over time. So you do can, can see an improvement in skin thickening even without any intervention. So the natural history of limited disease versus diffuse disease seems to be quite different. Um, and diffuse disease, we do tend to see that softening can occur of the skin over time. The next slide is a little bit busy, um, but I thought it would be nice to kind of show you the percentages of different um, symptoms and uh, disease presentations that can occur um, with the two subtypes. Um, and you will be able to see that limited and diffuse disease, there are some very common um, symptoms and presentations between the two. And then there are some things that are very different between the presentations when it comes to internal organ involvement. As I already mentioned, Raynaud's phenomenon is very common in both types of conditions um, and is over 90% of both um, presentations, both limited and diffuse will have uh, Raynaud's phenomenon. Um, another very common um, presentation between both subtypes is joint contractures. Um, pulmonary fibrosis or lung fibrosis is also um, equal between both, um, can, uh, both subtypes, but as you can see, only about 30 to 40% of patients will have lung fibrosis. So that means about 60 to 70% of patients will never have lung disease, which is good. Um, there are some rarer things that can occur um, in the internal organs in scleroderma. In particular, the kidney disease or what, what we see is a, what's called a scleroderma renal crisis. This is a rare presentation of scleroderma. It can take you by surprise as to the rapid onset of um, kidney failure in scleroderma. Um, thankfully, only about 1% of patients with limited scleroderma will present with renal involvement. Um, and 10% in diffuse disease. So whenever someone has diffuse scleroderma, we always um, like to ensure that they're well educated about the possible kidney involvement and, and monitoring of blood pressure at home is really important. Um, so now I'll, I'll come to how scleroderma is diagnosed. And um, really as, as rheumatologists, we do tend to see the bulk of patients with scleroderma, but sometimes if the heart and lungs are involved, then a cardiologist or a respiratory physician are sometimes um, the clinicians that will first come across this diagnosis. I do have sometimes even gastroenterologists referring patients to us at St Vincent's after someone's had a gastroscopy and seen some of the um, reflux or um, other gut presentations of scleroderma, um, and that can at times be the first presentation too. It can mimic other um, connected tissue diseases such as lupus, for example. So a lot of times 
um, a patient with Raynaud's phenomenon may be given the label of having lupus, but over time, if skin hardening occurs, then scleroderma is the diagnosis that that's made. Um, nail fold capillaroscopy is becoming um, a more widely used tool in the diagnosis of scleroderma, particularly in the early phases where a lot of skin hardening hasn't occurred. Um, and that's when a really high powered camera is used to look at the nail fold and can tell us whether or not any of the blood vessels have been affected um, by that increased collagen production um, or seeing abnormal vessels in the nail folds, um, which can help predict a diagnosis of scleroderma. Um, but really what's probably the most useful tool is the clinical features. So a clinical examination by a rheumatologist who's seen a lot of sclerodermas, the first step, but also um, the blood test and in particular, the uh, blood test called an anti-nuclear antibody or the ANA. Um, the ANA is really important because um, essentially an ANA must be positive in someone in order to make a diagnosis of scleroderma. scleroderma. So about 99% of patients with, with scleroderma will have a positive ANA. There is that very unusual case where an ANA is not positive, but a patient presents with the typical clinical features of scleroderma. Um, and again, I kind of like Reynolds phenomenon, having a positive ANA is actually very common, probably around seven to 10% of, of the general population has a positive ANA it doesn't mean that seven to 10% of people will go on to get a connective tissue disease such as scleroderma. Um, but I guess if you look at the flip side, with someone to make a diagnosis, they must have a positive ANA. When looking down a microscope, the pathologist can tell us about the various patterns of ANA that are seen under a microscope. And this can also be useful in making a diagnosis of scleroderma. In particular, uh, the anti-centromere antibody, which is a subtype of ANA, um, is highly associated with limited scleroderma. And those patients who have diffuse scleroderma tend to have a speckled or a nucleolar pattern. Um, one subtype of the ANA is called the SCL70 or topo isomerase antibody. And this um, poses a greater risk of developing lung disease over time. So if someone has a positive SCL70, then that would prompt me to look for lung disease and also monitor more closely for lung disease. And a very special antibody called the RNA polymerase antibody. Um, if it is positive, or if someone has that antibody, then their risk of renal crisis is fivefold greater than someone who doesn't. So again, if a polymerase antibody is positive, then I would tell patients to monitor renal function and their blood pressure at home. So these are various tools that have allowed us to uh, kind of individualize the management of patients with scleroderma um, because these antibodies have been uh, shown in research to have greater associations with certain clinical features. I thought I would mention about um, uh, the most common question that I would get in the clinics, which is why have I developed scleroderma or what causes scleroderma? And I guess uh, the short answer is we don't know. Um, but research, more and more research is showing about genetic predispositions to developing um, autoimmune conditions like scleroderma um, and also the um, potential environmental triggers, which again haven't been fully evaluated, um, but potential viral triggers or even environmental triggers. And we do know some industrial exposures can cause um, scleroderma like. Um, diseases, so exposure to vinyl chloride or another condition called toxic oil syndrome can um, uh, cause symptoms that are very much like scleroderma. We also now uh, know more and more about silica exposure in particular stone masons who, who made stone bench tops without adequate um, protective gear, particularly respiratory protective gear. Um, can present with not only lung disease, so fibrosis of the lungs, but also induction of the immune system, creating uh, a scleroderma-like presentation again. So again, Raynaud's phenomenon and skin thickening can occur with silica exposure. Um, and also something that can occur in uh, organ transplant patients called graft versus host disease, which is when um, that transplanted organ can induce an immune response, creating um, a scleroderma-like presentation as well. So these are the clues that we um, have from potential environmental triggers that can induce that immune response. 
Um, as I already mentioned, I do want to focus on the skin and Raynaud's phenomenon in this presentation, but I thought I'd briefly touch on the um, internal organs, in particular the lung, the GI tract, the kidneys and the heart. As I mentioned, the gut is very commonly um, uh, causes symptoms in patients with scleroderma. So reflux in particular occurs in about 90% of patients. Um, and sometimes the small bowel as well as the large bowel can become involved, in particular bloating, um, uh, feeling full very quickly, uh, constipation, diarrhea, and unfortunately sometimes even anal incontinence can occur. When it comes to the kidneys, I've already talked about um, the scleroderma renal crisis, um, which uh, tends to occur in patients with diffuse disease and that positive RNA polymerase. Interestingly, if you have the SCL70 antibody, it actually protects you from kidney disease. So you become very unlikely to get kidney disease if you have the SCL70 antibody. Um, and as I've mentioned, monitoring of blood pressure is really important in kidney presentations. The, the heart is also a potential organ that can become involved. That can uh, involve not only the heart muscle, um, with causing various arrhythmias through um, uh, interruption of the electrical systems within the heart, um, but also causing inflammation of the sac that the heart sits in or a pericardial eff effusion. I might just skip that slide. Um, and also high blood pressure within the heart and lungs. So that's somewhat different to the blood pressure that's tested in the arm when you go to your GP. A high blood pressure in the lungs is called is a condition called pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is another um, really important thing to monitor for in patients with scleroderma um, because that can cause shortness of breath over time and again, reduce life expectancy. And, uh, and finally, in regards to the lungs, as I've already mentioned, lung fibrosis or, um, or scarring of the lungs can occur. Um, that causes a shortness of breath and a dry cough. Um, and in some patients, it, it can become a very severe condition that uh, requires oxygen supplementation. Um, and as I already mentioned, that high blood pressure can occur in the lungs or pulmonary hypertension. Right, so I thought we'd now move on to managing um, scleroderma. Um, and really, it's, it is a very different thing for each patient. So there's no one rule for um, how uh, scleroderma is managed. And it really depends on what your symptoms are what organs um, are involved. And unfortunately, there's no um, kind of one shop stop, one stop shop. You have to look at the patient as the individual and see what is the priorities in, in their treatment. There's no overall, overall treatment or cure. So there's not one medication or drug that will um, treat all aspects of scleroderma. Um, so everyone's treatment plan will be different. Um, when assessing someone with scleroderma, um, as I've mentioned, I think it's really important to prioritise what those symptoms are for the patient and really go down that list in, in regards to how things are mentioned, uh, are treated. Um, as, as already mentioned at Scleroderma, we um, perform an annual cardi cardiopulmonary screening program, which means that every patient with scleroderma has annual tests to look at the lung and the heart function. Um, so we do look at the lungs quite closely. Um, and determine if there is any lung disease and how much, because that will determine what treatments are offered. Um, and also um, the skin disease, and if there is any rapid changes in the skin that would suggest a diagnosis of diffuse scleroderma, that's when we would want to um, uh, uh, offer interventions with, with um, certain drugs and certain Im immunosuppressive drugs. Um, when it comes to treatment, um, it depends on the organ. So as I've already mentioned, um, you know, if you have uh, Raynaud's phenomenon, that's going to be managed differently to someone who's got lung disease and that will be managed differently to someone who's got reflux. Um, so really, it's the treatments are designed to reduce symptoms. And there are some treatments, although there are limited, we've got limited availability, but there are some treatments um, that will aim to reverse some of the presentations of scleroderma or to slow down the process. So, for example, if someone has lung disease, then we do have drugs available that slow down the process. But unfortunately, that we don't have any drugs at the moment that will reverse any damage that's already occurred. When it comes to Raynaud's phenomenon and uh, in the a chilly winter right at the minute, we're seeing quite a lot of it. Um, really, uh, there are quite 
kind of common sense or conservative things that can be done that will really help. Um, so in particular, dressing very warmly, um, in particular, keeping your core temperature up, not just wearing gloves, but then not wearing uh, multiple layers in, in the core. So keeping the core temperature warm, wearing gloves, scarves and hats is very important and keeping your house and workplace warm and um, even, you know, um, seems like simple suggestions, but really, um, for example, when you need to wash your hands, turning the warm water on and waiting for it to become warm before washing hands, not just rushing into the cold um, water or even when going to the car, um, have the car turned on for five minutes beforehand um, so that the heater is on so that you're not getting into a really icy cold chilly car or, or, or um, you know, touching a very cold steering wheel. Um, there, the, um, there's these new kind of chemical um, hand warmers that you kind of squeeze and put into your pockets. So uh, patients have come to me and shown me various different um, very cool things that can be placed into the pockets or even in socks um, to keep the hands and feet warm. And daily exercise is really important too. So improving circulation and getting the, the heart pumping and the cardiovascular system working is really important in preventing episodes of Reynolds phenomenon. And one thing that I cannot um, press upon enough is cessation of smoking. So if someone has scleroderma and they have a lot of Reynolds phenomenon, then, then they must stop smoking. Um, and we would support them in any way possible in order to do that because um, uh, the irritating, uh, you know, chemical components of cigarettes um, cause vasospasm, which means that the blood vessels um, do narrow even further. Um, and that just exacerbates episodes of Reynolds phenomenon. So I can't uh, press on upon this enough. Um, that uh, smoking cessation is so, so important. Uh, if conservative measures don't work, so stopping smoking, keeping warm, all of those things, um, there are certain drugs available that can help with Reynolds phenomenon, in particular um, certain blood pressure medications. Um, and the first line tends to be calcium channel blockers, so drugs like nifedipine, philodipine, diltiazem. Another um, uh, blood pressure medication um, it, uh, drug class is called an ACE inhibitor, so that's drugs like ramipril. Um, and there is an antidepressant called fluoxetine, which is meant to have um, a, a relaxing, a vessel relaxing um, qualities, so that can help with uh, getting blood flow down to the fingers. Um, and also sildenafil, which is commonly known as a drug called Viagra, which helps with blood flow again. So we do sometimes use that in, in uh, managing Reynolds phenomenon and um, complications of it like digital ulcerations. And if Reynolds phenomenon does result in skin breakdown, so if there is um, such a lack of blood flow down to fingers that ulceration of the skin occurs, and that's when we kind of reserve more adva advanced treatments. So um, infusions um, that require ad admissions to hospital with uh, prostaglandins, so a drug called Isopros, which is quite a potent vasodilator, so that will open up the vessels um, with uh, quite a strong medication called Isoprost. Um, we really use um, something called surgical sympathectomy, which really is a procedure that um, helps with the nervous system that uh, controls the um, blood vessels narrowing and relaxing. So that can be offered um, in the more severe cases. And sometimes we ask plastic surgeons to do Botox injections around the vessels, particularly in the hands, um, which can help with that vasodilation as well. Looking after um, your skin when you have scleroderma is also really important, um, particularly when it becomes dry and itchy, which is a very common complaint as well. Um, really, there's no magic cures for that, but really keeping as moisturised as possible with the more simple barrier creams is really important. So even just um, the cheap stuff like sorbolene or lanolin is really, really helpful. Um, and also being quite vigilant with the skin. So if there is any small amount of skin breakdown, then to seek treatment early uh, is important with either the GP or if you're in uh, part of a specialised centre like St Vincent's, we actually have the luxury of having um, a scleroderma specific nurse who's really good with wound care um, and she's always um, happy to see anybody that has any new skin ulcerations or skin cuts and seeing them early is really important to avoid the need for any of those advanced treatments that I've that I've mentioned. So as I've already mentioned, unfortunately, digital ulceration can occur. And sometimes if ulcers are bad enough, then 
um, you know, coming into hospital for either either pros with or without antibiotics is required. Sometimes we do ask the surgeons to come and have a look and sometimes um, debride or kind of um, improve the blood circulation by getting down to healthy tissue um, is required. Sometimes if we find that the larger vessels are blocked, then we can get stents down into those larger vessels. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes amputation is the only um, only uh, treatment that would be a viable option. So sometimes um, partial finger or toe amputations are required. Itch is also really common and um, probably underreported because patients always um, want to talk about their other symptoms, but itch is a really important part of it. So again, antihistamines can be used. Keeping the skin as moisturised as possible um, uh, is also um, required. Sometimes we ask our dermatology colleagues to help um, with this symptom as well. Um, when it comes to more um, advanced um, uh, treatments or immunosuppressive treatments for skin disease, um, these can be offered, um, particularly in someone who's presenting with diffuse disease. And if I take you back to um, the uh, original graph that I um, had put up, um, if someone presents with diffuse disease, they really shoot up quite quickly with a lot of skin thickening. And it's in those instances that we can commence immune suppression medications um, and, but with the limited disease because it tends to have a very slow onset um, then that's the uh, type that we may not need to initiate because it only may affect the fingers um, and not progress um, any further than that so exposure to immune suppression treatments are unlikely to be beneficial. So when it comes to immune suppression treatments particularly for managing the skin um, we do use uh, medications like methotrexate which has been around a really long time and used for other inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis very commonly. Um, and if that doesn't work, then other medications like mycophenolate, which is a drug, uh, a organ transplant medication, and cyclophosphamide, which is an usually uh, used intravenously, um, can also be, be considered. Um, as the graph also showed you, some patients will improve without in, any intervention, so uh, it's not always required in all patients. So I, I thought I'd touch briefly on methotrexate just because that's probably the most common medication that we commence um, in regards to immune suppression treatment in patients with scleroderma. Um, it can be very helpful obviously in the arthritis component because we know that it works in other arthritic conditions but also in regards to the skin um, there have been some small trials showing that the skin score or the level of skin thickening that when it's measured by a rheumatologist can stabilize over 12 months in patients with um, a new diagnosis of diffuse disease. Um, and in that trial, it was a quite a small dose. So sometimes we do uh, consider um, pushing a patient up to a high dose as this may um, allow for a greater benefit. So I thought I, I would conclude there. Um, and uh, really in, in my conclusion, I guess um, we can uh, summarize scleroderma as a multi-organ connective tissue disease. Um, obviously the skin is the thing that's most obvious, but the uh, internal organs are commonly affected. It has a very wide spectrum of severity, so some patients will only have Raynaud's phenomenon and some slight skin thickening, whereas on the other end of the spectrum, some patients will have quite severe cardiac and pulmonary involvement, uh, which will require multiple disciplines to look after them. Unfortunately, there's no cure for scleroderma, but there are treatments available to slow it down. And really research is still ongoing and um, in Australia we have a really strong research team uh, throughout uh, Australia uh, working on uh, various clinical um, research projects uh, to support our decisions when we're looking after uh, patients with scleroderma. So um, thank you again for having me here and um, that's everything that I've got for tonight but I understand we may be having some questions. Yes, uh, thanks very much, Nava. That was a really informative uh, presentation. That's the first time we've actually had a webinar on scleroderma and Raynaud's phenomenon uh, in many years of presenting webinars. So uh, it was really uh, interesting to hear further detail around um, the various conditions. Uh, we have got a couple of questions that have come through and I encourage anyone who has a question to type it into the question box now because uh, we will finish strictly at uh, 8 o'clock Australian Eastern Standard Time. Um, okay, so some of the questions 
that have come through. Um, if a patient presents with Raynaud's, what screening tests need to be done to exclude connective tissue disease? Or do you just do that if, if they have other features? Yeah, that's a good do question. Just, yeah. yeah, so I guess the way that I'd look at it is a couple of things. So absolutely a clinical examination is paramount. So um, Raynaud's phenomenon in a young woman is very common. I've, it, some research even suggests 10 to 15% of young women have Raynaud's phenomenon. So I don't think I'd go testing all of those women for an underlying connective tissue disease. but um, I think if there are uh, any other features that make it suspicious, whether it be a new onset of fatigue, whether it be um, some joint pain associated with it, um, or even some subtle skin changes or puffy fingers, um, then uh, doing a blood test that includes an ANA um, and also um, an ENA, which is one of the subtypes of um, ANA, uh, would be a good place to start. And Nava, um, is there any relationship between this and any form of um, amyloidosis? I'm not quite sure what the, this refers to, yeah. but amyloidosis? No. Yeah, uh, no, they're different different conditions. Yeah, so, so no strict relationship between them. Okay, I have a, a longer question here. Uh, someone has asked, um, they've been diagnosed with zero negative sorry, psoriatic arthritis many years ago, and then following radiotherapy treatment for breast cancer in the last two years, they've now been diagnosed with lichen sclerosis and morphia in anatomically distinct areas. This person has also experienced Raynaud's phenomenon over many times over the years. Now, could you please discuss how these autoimmune conditions are linked? Mm. Yeah, very the... good. Yeah, so I did touch on morphia briefly um, in, in the presentation and um, it, it can be labelled as what's called localised scleroderma, but I think that's a bit of a misnomer because it implies that the underlying um, uh, autoimmune process is the same. So. Um, our understanding of morphia is, is, is that it's, a, it's not necessarily related to the same process that occurs in scleroderma. Um, so that's one thing. It tends to be ANA negative. So um, if it's, it is definitely morphia, then you shouldn't have a positive ANA with it. Um, when it comes to psoriatic arthritis and um, lichen sclerosis, um, I, I guess what I could say is that maybe this person is somewhat autoimmune, okay? So um, it is possible that uh, someone has the predisposition to autoimmune conditions. Um, there's no direct link between psoriatic arthritis and scleroderma, and I must say it would be very unusual to have both conditions, um, particularly if psoriasis is, is part of um, someone's presentation, then uh, having an additional diagnosis of scleroderma would be rare. Um, so, but it is possible to get an inflammatory arthritis with scleroderma, but not with psoriasis. So it is really getting down to the nitty gritty there. But I think the first step would be again, um, having an ANA test um, because that can give a lot of clues. In particular, if it is positive, then the pattern of the ANA can be helpful in deciding whether or not there is a link between all of these conditions. Mm. And actually another part to the question, um, Nava, uh, which would probably uh, a lot of people can relate to, um, which specialty is best to manage this range of conditions or you, do you still need to see a dermatologist and a rheumatologist? This person is actually under seven specialists at, at the moment and of course that presents quite a financial, emotional and time burden. Yeah, I, I, can, I can totally understand that, yeah. I think that um, because scleroderma is quite rare then um, a lot of clinicians may not necessarily feel completely apt to, to manage it um, on their own and they require the, the help of multiple disciplines. Um, what I must say though is uh, definitely a rheumatologist is somebody that would be the most um, the most kind of uh, qualified and, and able to coordinate um, management of a patient. Um, and particularly if someone has internal organ involvement, then I would tend to say that management in a larger centre that has the ability to access lung physicians and cardiologists with a bit more ease and have multidisciplinary meetings, which um, what we do, for example, at, in St. Vincent's have that access, where we're very grateful and lucky, um, then that's when I would suggest that 
maybe a coordination in one team uh, would be better rather than kind of traveling all over town to various specialists. So um, that would probably be my suggestion to head to, to a centre that, um, that can coordinate a bit better. Yep, great. Thank you for that. Um, Nava, is there any link with chill blames to scleroderma or Raynaud's? And what is the best treatment for chill blames? Yeah, so chill blames, yes, can occur in anyone that gets Raynaud's phenomenon, whether it's due to just Raynaud's phenomenon on its own or because of an underlying autoimmune disease. And Raynaud's phenomenon is not exclusive to scleroderma in regards to our diseases, so it can occur in lupus as well. Um, and the management of chill blains will be very similar to the management of Raynaud's phenomenon. So the better the blood flow, the less presentations of chill blains that you're going to get. Um, chill blains can be very itchy, so there are kind of topical steroid creams that you can put on um, the blisters that occur in chill blains. Um, sometimes um, getting even GTN patches, which are the patches that patients with chest pain users are put on the hands, but I tend to find that most patients don't tolerate that particularly well because it can give you quite a severe headache. Um, so I tend to skip the GTM patches when it comes comes to chill blains. But really it's it the, the first step will be those really common sense but sometimes easy to forget things to do, which is just keeping warm and don't allow that initial trigger of, of that sudden change in temperature occur. Mm. And Nava, um, could you talk about the uh, briefly about the side effects of methotrexate? Yeah, so um, methotrexate has been used for a really long time, um, you know, over four decades for management of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so we generally know it's a very safe medication. The most common side effect will be gastrointestinal, so getting a bit of nausea, um, sometimes a bit of diarrhea with um, with methotrexate because it's a once a week medication. It's actually um, it's actually quite um, appealing to most people because they don't have to take it every day. And if the side effects do occur, it tends to be in that first 24 to 48 hours after taking the dose. Um, so it's generally manageable throughout the week. Um, there are some rarer things that, that can happen with methotrexate. So um, liver dysfunction can occur. So we always recommend very regular blood monitoring when you're on methotrexate. Mouth ulcers and hair thinning can occur, but if you have enough folate supplementation with methotrexate, then those things can generally be managed quite well. Um, and also lowering of blood counts can occur too. So again, monitoring of blood, blood tests is important. It is an Im immune suppressive medication. So um, infections um, are a risk with methotrexate, um, particularly more viral infections rather than severe bacterial infections. <clears throat> And Nava, how about how would you go about managing Raynaud's and systematic lupus, systemic lupus, uh, especially in regards to flare-ups? Yeah, um, yeah. So again, it's really those um, kind of, I guess, the the two types of management: the conservative management, oral medications, and then the more advanced intravenous treatments that we have available, or sometimes surgical treatments. So um, that advice would also be applicable to patients with lupus. So um, very similar. Things. So alaprost infusions, calcium channel blockers from the medication perspective and um, keeping warm, keeping warm and not smoking. Mm. And I think you probably answered this before, but just is there a link with Raynaud's and other autoimmune conditions such as psoria, um, psoria, um, psoriasis, psoriasis? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the um, rhinos, so, the yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, um, with psoriasis, probably no. So psoriatic arthritis is uncommon to see um, have someone have um, a, it, I guess the way that I put it is Raynaud's phenomenon is common. And if you have a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis, I don't think necessarily it would be directly related. Um, in regards to the connective tissue diseases though, um, there is a spectrum of, of connective tissue diseases that will present with Raynaud's phenomenon. So uh, lupus is probably the most common. Um, there are other conditions like mixed connective tissue disease, which is a very rare disease, um, and some other muscle diseases that can sometimes present with uh, Raynaud's phenomenon, and then obviously scleroderma as well. So it's probably more in the spectrum of um, the connective tissue diseases as opposed to the inflammatory arthritis um, diseases like psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. 
Mm. Um, someone's asked if there's pain in, in your elbows, but an arthritis test is negative, might it be scleroderma? But that's probably unlikely so or? Ask, yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess it depends on the clinical presentation. So it's a hard one to answer, but I guess any joint pain uh, has to be considered under a potential autoimmune disease. So that could be anything. Sorry, I can't really answer that over a webinar. Mm. Um, another one, I have autoimmune problems, PMA, temporal uh, arthritis and osteoarthritis. Been taking collagen products for joint breakdown. I'm 80 years of age. Is this bad? Um, so when it comes to the inflammatory conditions, um, so this is really coming off, off topic now. So th these kinds of conditions are not scleroderma related. So temporal arteritis or polymyalgia rheumatica are inflammatory conditions um, of the blood vessels that are not connected to diseases. Um, so the use of supplementations is controversial. We've probably got some mild data that suggests things like turmeric and glucosamine are helpful in um, osteoarthritis, particularly in the early phases, but in conditions like temporal arteritis and polymyalgia rheumatica, I think it's probably unlikely to be having a huge benefit. Mm. Also, can aqua aerobics help with these conditions um, as, as it might for other arthritic conditions? Yeah, so that's a really great question. So um, yes, the short answer is yes. So I think that um, any form of um, cardiovascular movement is really important in improving a uh, patient's quality of life. So whether that be through aqua aerobics or graded exercise programs or cardiac rehabilitation or pulmonary rehab rehabilitation, which sometimes we do um, request patients to consider doing if they have cardiac or lung disease, um, then these have been shown in multiple different diseases, um, including scleroderma, to improve a patient's quality of life. Mm. Actually, following on from that, um, someone's asking about the what's the optimal intensity of exercise required to improve circulation and slow down the progress of scleroderma? Oh, um, it, nothing will really slow down the progress of scleroderma from an exercise perspective. Um, it's always going to be useful no matter what. I would say getting a good puff is always good. I, I cannot give you any kind of certain parameters to reach, so whether that be a certain heart rate. Um, but, but you know, getting a, a good amount of uh, walking um, is, is, is even sufficient um, as long as you've got enough pace to get a good puff. So that's probably the, the best I can do. But a heart rate parameter, I don't think there's been any specific research into that. Mm. And I think we have last question for the evening. Uh, any link, uh, Nava, between Raynaud's and, hor and hormones? Oh, good question. Um, not that I'm aware of directly, um, but I do know certain patients will say that, for example, before a menstrual cycle that their joints feel worse. Um, not necessarily Raynaud's phenomenon per se. Um, obviously, um, the seasons are really important in Raynaud's phenomenon. So Patients will move to warmer climates in order to um, manage their Raynaud's phenomenon. But from a hormonal perspective, I'm not aware of um, specific research, but I could look into that and get back to you. Mm -hmm. All right. On that note, uh, we've just hit eight o'clock uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time. So thank you so much, Nava, for a very uh, informative presentation and for um, withstanding the uh, some of the technical difficulties we uh, experienced this evening. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us uh, this evening for the webinar. Please go to our website www.msk.org.au and uh, please fill in our National Consumer Survey um, that would be uh, there on the front page of our website. Um, so uh, I urge you all to go and have a have a, a um, undertake the survey, which we're looking for lots of people around Australia to do in the next couple of weeks. So on that note, thanks again, Nava. Thanks everyone for joining, and have a good evening. Good night.